Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is part 28 of What If Deku Had a Vampire Quirk. If you guys enjoy this what if, and want to see part 29 of it, comment down below and let me know. Also check out previous parts of this what if. I have created a playlist for this what if, where you can find all the previous parts, link is in the description. And go ahead and check out other what ifs in the channel. Before we start please do support for more awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like, and also share this video with your friends. So let's start this video. Control Room Unauthorized Entry Forbidden Staff Members Only The door sported such sign, the vampire scanning through with his special eyes and noticing that there were three people in the room, their frames weirdly. Melissa was about to go past him to open the door, but Izuku harshly pulled her back, standing in front of her and using his gauntlet-clad arms as shields. The door pulverized the next moment as a shower of bullets ripped clean through it. The rounds hit Izuku, the vampire managing to keep his mouth shut, the pain enormous. He was quite sure that his blood gauntlets would withstand most calibers if used as protection, but whatever these grunts were shooting, it packed more than a punch. The bullets managed to get past his gauntlets, and were buried deep within the flesh of his arms, not fully piercing only due to the hardness of the blood metal. The vampire snarled, his ears ringing due to the sound of the shots. The warped metal bits in his flesh, were being slowly pushed out, Izuku glancing back to make sure, that Melissa was safe. She had fallen on the ground, unharmed, yet undoubtedly scared off her mind. Before the mercenaries in the room could fire another barrage at him, Izuku blinked into the room, appearing right in the middle of the three mercs, who were in a triangular formation. The woman in front of the vampire, widened her eyes at his sudden emergence in the room, but she was too slow to avoid the rising knee that slammed into her crotch. The vampire grabbing the side of her face with one hand, and slamming the woman's head into the floor with enough force, that she bounced slightly, unconscious and with a bleeding scalp. The other two men trailed their weapons on the vampire, but before they could fill the teen with more holes, two crimson tentacles were stuffed inside the gun barrels, a cracking sound occurring as a strange red-colored ice suddenly built up on the firearm's frame and the weapons jammed. Izuku jumped while spinning around, his legs splitting to deliver a kick to each man. The one on the left was hit on the nose, while the remaining one took the blow to his chest. The vampire barely touched the ground, before he shot towards the merc with the broken nose, the man still stunned and incapable of reacting, when Izuku's right hand covered the entirety of his face. The gauntlet's claws pierced the flesh, and secured their hold, the teen spinning around and using coagulation to paralyze the man, his comrade pointing a pistol at the two, yet not being able to shoot due to the human shield. The grunt tried to shift his aim, to manage a hit against Izuku, but he didn't allow it, moving his flesh shield along with the gun's aim. To the merc's surprise, something pierced his left foot and soon he was incapable of movement too, only his eyes managed to barely look down, spotting a tendril of black-red color stabbing into his foot. Izuku bit into the neck of his shield, proceeding to drain him with scurly rapid efficiency, before throwing the man aside, as if he was trash. The second grunt was still paralyzed by the mixed tendril constantly activating coagulation, the sight of the slowly approaching teen one that shouldn't be as scary as it was for him right now. With slow steps Izuku approached the man, slowly opening his maw, to reveal the pearly white fangs stained with crimson, the saliva strings breaking apart only adding to his fear. Please, no, we were just following the orders. Izuku's answer was silence and a mouthful of poisonous blood. The sound of the man frothing at the mouth as poison worked on his system, was the only thing, that echoed in the room. While Izuku drained the man of his blood, the female mercenary slowly dragged herself out of the room, sacrificing her guards, as she was the tech girl, to flee. Wolfram had never mentioned anything about them facing a monster wearing a child's skin suit. She reached the destroyed doorframe, and poked her head out, spotting Melissa waiting for Izuku to finish up. She was about to call her out when she felt something wrap around her leg and lightly tug at it. Help. She called out towards Melissa, the blonde's head snapping towards the woman and her voice. The female grunt tried to extend a hand to the American, but the limb was then snagged out the air by a shadowy tendril. Before the woman could say anything else she was suddenly pulled back towards the back of the room, any scream that she could have echoed muffled by the blood tentacle that stuffed her mouth full. While all this happened, Melissa stared at the doorframe with a dull gaze. Her mind screamed at her, that this scene was not something normal, that this sort of behavior shouldn't be something a hero student was capable of. Yet, the warning didn't seem to register in her head. It was almost like an out-of-body experience. Fear and hesitation were not registering in her mind, cold and logical rationale dictated that the action was fully warranted. Stranger yet, it was almost like something deep in her approved of the infliction of this violence upon the invaders. She entered the room with easy steps, just in time to see Izuku pull his fangs away from the female grunt's neck, and hang his head backwards, his throat moving lightly as he drank the life liquid inside his gullet. A savage expression was painted on Izuku's face as he finished his most recent meal, the only noise echoing in the room, being the ping of the metal bullet fragments leaving his arms and falling on the floor. Melissa ignored the sight, turning towards the wall filled with many monitors and an enormous keyboard. 
The blonde approached it and grabbed herself a fallen chair, sitting down and beginning to type away on the board. Izuku hung back while Melissa worked on the security system, his heartbeats echoing in his ears like music. An orchestra play, a beautiful rhythm that only he could hear. The song of life and death. A new symphony began to play out close to his own, other three dull songs pathetically playing close to the two magnificent ones. His sight was dyed in tones of red, Izuku finding himself drawn to this new song, so familiar, yet so distinct. Another group of tasty morsels. When shall we have the main banquet? It waits for us. These side dishes are interestingly flavored, but we need to have the main dish. Izuku deeply breathed in air, a scent tickling his mind and mildly bringing the red haze down. Not enough to stop the almost orgasmic sounds of the song that played close to him, but enough to allow his eyes to see who was playing about such amazing song. He saw no one besides Melissa, the girl busy with reprogramming the island's security system. The annoying alarm that blared throughout the building finally stopped, and a few seconds later Izuku picked up on the sounds of one of the radios crackling to life. His cast shadow on the ground extended towards the woman, her radio being the active one. The shadow rose from the ground and brought the item to Izuku. The vampire's blood almost sublimating so great as the speed with which it was consumed to fuel the breakthrough of one of the recent quirk factors he had acquired. Boy, Carmine. What's the status of the situation? Wolfram's voice echoed on the other end of the radio, loudly demanding an answer. Izuku coughed a bit, the initial use of this new quirk factor a bit strange to him. Boss, we have managed to capture the stragglers. It was that kid Midoriya and the shield's daughter. The voice that echoed from Izuku's mouth was definitively not his own. Tone, pitch, intensity, all those resembled perfectly the voice of the woman grunt called Carmine. Richard and Nelson were jumped by them, but I got Oscar and Mike to squash the runs. Bratz didn't even know what hit them. There was a satisfied laughter that echoed from the radio, the leader of the group clearly satisfied with the answer. Great, bring them in. I'm not gonna say no to a big, fat bonus in my paycheck. Our client is gonna love the presents. Roger that. Over and out. The vampire answered, waiting for the radio to run silent, before he crushed it in his gauntleted grip. Memories were quickly being played in his head, enhanced mind allowing Izuku to make sense of the information that otherwise would have taken much more time to run through. One ghostly name echoed in his mind at Wolfram's mention of the group's client, the vampire's body breaking into a cold sweat, yet also becoming full of rage. That woman, Carmine, had been one of the mercenary leaders second in command, thus she was privy to information that the other grunts had no business knowing. All for one. Izuku whispered to himself, the puzzle finally completed, a terrifying realization for one to have. The name whispered by all those in the darkness of society, in the criminal underbelly of the world. Japan's own Bujimin, the man that was, contrary to All Might's title of symbol of peace, called the symbol of evil. Wolfram was in contact with the dark legend, being contracted to steal very important items from the security of I Island's vaults. How the duo of villains had acquired such information was not in Carmine's blood memories, but that was not what was important now. The growl left Izuku's throat as the memory of their objectives echoed in his mind, the vampire's shadow tendrils piercing the floor around Izuku, and deeply cracked the porcelain of the room. How dare you? Our effort and passion. Our power. You dare try to attempt to steal it. Thunderous thoughts stormed inside Izuku's head, his expression becoming fiercer than the fearbringer gaze that he showed during his fight against Bakugo in the school festival. Ludicrous. 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 The inner beast's roars echoed in his mind like thunderclaps, the vampire barely restraining his body from destroying the entirety of the room. His heartbeat in his chest was like the beating drums of a fierce war god, the vampire trying and failing to calm himself. Something touched his face and Izuku almost lashed out with a devastating punch, the beginnings of a god-shattering star building up on his right gauntlet-clad fist. Stop! Precious mate. The gauntlet burst, life liquid splattering uselessly on the ground as his arm stopped still midair. Melissa was in front of him, looking worried at his state. He immediately sculled his features, letting cooling blood flow in his head, aiding the passive effect of enhanced mind, and allowing the hemomancer a semblance of control over his mind. That was dangerous. He stated, trying his best to put some humor in his tone, but failing to do so. Your mind was running a thousand miles per hour. Melissa said, her blue orb shining with a light tint of crimson due to his work, but also displaying her worry over him. Izuku shook his head, and took her hand off his face, directing his attention towards the screens, to search for something else, that wasn't his temper, to put as the center topic. His rapid scan revealed that besides the hostages, two girls were being surrounded by a sea of security bots. Melissa. The vampire shouted, the blonde already back on her chair and typing away at a keyboard. She immediately tried to disengage the machines, but her input was denied. She tried again, the result being the same. Melissa, hurry up. Izuku shouted once more, staring at the screen and seeing Momo blow apart a group of the robots with a cannon. I'm trying. Something is still blocking full control of the system. It is like a virus. 
the blonde hurriedly replied. The vampire snarled to himself. Stay here then. Keep your guard up and immediately contact me if anyone comes close to you. He ordered, not wasting time. One step had Izuku out the room, his shape something Melissa could barely follow in the video feed as he became a blur. Kyoka panted tiredly, soaked in sweat, and feeling her hair stick to her forehead in a mess that she could not afford to care for right now. She pushed another continuous wave of sound from her ear jacks, the pressure of it being transmitted through a specialized speaker Yamomo had created for her. The group of security bots in front of her being hammered away, but soon another group took their place. The rocker girl grit her teeth and attacked again. The Aerozu placed another shell inside the cannon she built, immediately firing it upon the robots that threatened to overwhelm them. They had managed to flee quite efficiently from the patrolling mercenaries on the lower floors, but just as they were about to truly escape the building, to search for help reinforcements, an alarm blared throughout the building, and soon enough a multitude of security robots were rushing them. The girls managed to escape from the bots for a while, but after 10 minutes, their escape ended as they had reached a dead end, the duo unknowingly being guided by the robots, that had cut off all their paths until they were pushed to flee to one of the maintenance facility floor of the building. Now the girls had entrenched themselves, and played a defensive war, pushing back the waves of pursuing bots with their quirks. Momo was tired, the continuous use of her creation quirk demanding the use of her lipids, the strain already apparent as her luscious, and full body had been considerably depleted. Proximity mines, her cannon, noise-canceling earphones, the shells, Kyoka speakers and a few titanium steel shields to protect them had Momo on her last legs, the rich heiress continuously reloading the weapon and firing it. It was a desperate last stand to resist the machines hell-bent on their capture, the girls unsure what their destiny would be if they were captured by the menaces. Kyoka's last attack fell short, the erratic beat of her heart not producing the desired power to push back the group of machines that enclosed on her. The punk rocker ducked behind one of the six shields, dodging the rubber round that thunked against her protective barrier. When she poked her head out, she had to immediately duck again, else she'd take on a barrage of the shots to her forehead. Yeah Momo. This is not looking good. Juro shouted, uncaring about her tone. The air turned her cannon on its axis, aiming at the damaged, but functional machines that were aiming for her friend. Another pull of the trigger, another roar of her cannon as a 12mm he round destroyed the bots. She was running low on ammunition, and she wasn't sure if she could continue pumping them out. A-H-H. Momo shouted in pain, one rubber round impacting against her back and taking her breath away. She fell on the ground, luckily behind her shields, and clutched at her chest, desperately trying to pull some air in her lungs. Kyuka rushed at her, hugging the frame of her friend, and bringing the girl's torso up to allow her to breathe properly. The rocker shouted in anger, and plugged both her jacks into the speaker, allowing the terribly loud in her ears thumping of her heart to be fully directed into the piece. There was a terrible pressure on their bodies as the equipment short-circuited, unable to handle the output that the girl had forced on it. Forget pushing the machines away, the rocker now was feeling woozy. She felt something warm run from her ears, sure that she had damaged something in her noggin, even with the protection afforded by the noise-canceling earphones. Damn it. Kyoka shouted in her mind. Tears began prickling at her eyes, the rocker resisting her best to avoid shedding them. She clutched the thinner iris in a hug. It was frustrating. She had won against villains in the USJ attack, but now she was being bested by a bunch of tin cans with fancy housing. She looked down at Momo, and found the heirs to be giving her a hurt and trembling smile. K, we, tr, bess. Juro heard the various bots reload their weaponry, ready to deliver their painful payload upon them. Ninpu Hisatsu, Tepeki no Bajo. Shinobi Art's ultimate move, Ironclad Defense, male voice echoed in the room, something suddenly appearing among the girls. The red tendrils encased the titanium steel shields, and moved the heavy pieces closer, protecting the girls from the shower of rubber rounds that was fired upon them. Ninpu Hisatsu, Shutsujin Kier. Shinobi Art's ultimate move, Apparition Killer, Momo recognized that voice. There was also only one person among her current friends that had ninja training and was around. A ray of hope broke through a group of the menacing machines, their frames sheared apart. Izuku, wielding a blood-red Kadachi blade, had arrived to their rescue. The vampire wasted no time to jump into action, the blade in his hand being swung with power and precision that was unmatched. To the rich heiress's surprise the team was also holding a gun in his other hand. Well, now that Momo properly focused on him, there were many dark matter tendrils sprouting from his shadow, the extra limbs all holding firearms too. After the team secured the girl's safety, he jumped atop the shields, gaining a height advantage, but also being in the sights of every remaining security bot. That seemed to not matter for the vampire, Yoyorozu spotting a malicious smile splitting his lips, the vampire's fangs gleaming as he focused. The shadow tendrils holding the guns trailed right behind him, pointing their barrels at the robots. Izuku pointed his blade towards the machines and said, Fire. 
Momo and Kyuka were lucky to be already wearing hearing protection, else their ears would be bleeding right now as the guns that the Hemomancer was carrying began firing without rest, spending all their current ammunition in a bullet storm that swept the entire maintenance room they were in. Soon the guns ran dry, their empty clicking the only sound echoing besides that of destroyed machinery crumbling down on the spot. Izuku searched for signs that any bot had remained, but all that he could spot was scrap metal and leaking coolant and oil. He even searched with electromagnetic vision, but he had cleared the room. The tentacles holding the shields returned to the team, dropping the defensive wall and allowing the two girls to see the sight of the destruction Izuku had caused. Momo and Jiro had done well defending themselves, but witnessing the sea of broken machines was a strange sight. Hello there, Kyoka-san, Momo-san. Izuku greeted hurriedly, but still somewhat amusingly. Kyoka released a relief sigh and allowed her knees to weaken, the rocker girl falling on her ass. Vampy your timing is impeccable. The punk girl said in between tired huffs, the hemomancer noticing the slight bleeding of her ears. The Eirozu also displayed a relief of seeing the vampire, smiling as a greeting to him. She then went to check on Kyoka, turning her back to Izuku and allowing the vampire to see the forming bruise on her back, the purple circle expanding slowly as they were allowed a breather. The shine of her cork began to light up on her exposed right arm, but it was clear that Momo was strained, the production of the medical gods taking a few extra seconds instead of the almost instant rate she knew herself capable of. The adrenaline coursing in her veins didn't allow the airs to stabilize her hands, the girl trying to clean the blood off Jiro's ears. I don't need you guys to babysit me, okay? The rocker exclaimed, taking the gauze from Momo's hand and doing the cleaning herself. Izuka rolled his eyes at the girl and her attitude, aware that she didn't want to seem and look weak. The vampire let the girls have their moment for now, showing his back and hiding away his face from the girls, lest they see the deranged smile and the sharp fangs glistening with saliva. The scent was intoxicating, Kyuka's lovely smell pulling at the hemomancer's sanity and enticing him to have just a little taste. His mouth watered, and the vampire couldn't keep his usually calm face, preferring to hide the expression painted on his face. The lilac lavender smoky smell teased his nose and Izuku couldn't help but take a deep breath. It is said that blood is thicker than water. It is what joins us, binds us, curses us, master. Let us join our rivers of life. Embrace her already. The vampire ignored the whispers of the beast within, for if he paid attention, gave it any ground to stand on, it would break free from its cage, Izuku would change to something else. He ran his tongue over his fangs, trying to ease the itching. Ha! Huh? So this is what caused the machine's madness, what a neat little forged ability. There was a pull in the vampire's mind, a tiny tug, that another part of him did to call attention to a new quirk factor. He managed to fix his expression as he let the knowledge wash over his mind, the answers being relayed by his blood. He hummed, now understanding why the security bots kept on attacking, even while Melissa had assumed some control over the security system back. Technopathy. Carmine, the female mercenary co-leader could let her mind dive inside machines and alter coding, giving her almost complete control over tech. She sparely used the quirk, as it was quite taxing on a normal mind, but with one use the woman had effectively infected I island systems with bugs and backdoor coding that facilitated the group's invasion. However, this was not her original quirk. It had traces of her DNA all over it, but it had been recently modified, tinkered with and improved as an initial payment for their job. It feels quite artificial. Almost like Kurigiri's power. It infuriated Izuku. To be underestimated like these by these people. Yet, he held in his rage, and let the boiling rage in his mind to become a simmering thing. It wouldn't do for him to let his rage control his actions, especially now with his classmates together with him. He needed to remain in control. Kyoka, Yoirozu. Izuka called out, getting the girls to focus back on him. He turned around, the two girls flinching a bit under his sharp gaze, but still willing to be close to him. The vampire took a deep breath, and released it as steam from his mouth, quite obviously not pleased with the situation. I hope that you two are alright. The situation is quite complex right now, but the short story is that I Island is under attack by a mercenary group, and they plan on stealing very important and dangerous items from the vaults here in the building. Izuku began explaining, while also checking out his weaponry, reloading all the empty magazines and checking out the state of the guns. Out of the five automatic rifles Ha had, three were quite heated, it proved that these were not ordinary weapons, since Izuku could feel a great static energy flow in them when they were firing shots. He finished his checkup, and let the weapons remain secured by the shadow matter tendrils behind him. I know that they have taken quite a number of hostages. He said, the girls nodding. Momo raised a hand, while Kyoka stayed silent. Izuku nodded to the heiress, giving her the chance to speak. Kyoka said noticed something was amiss earlier, and we managed to flee, before we were also taken hostage. All Might Sensei was restrained, and they took Shield Sensu somewhere. The raven-haired girl's words made Izuku narrow his eyes, the fearbringer gaze he was known for painting his features. We need to get the pros free to help us out. Getting civilians out of the line of fire is a priority too. 
I tried to make a few long-reach radios to try to reach anyone, nothing but static played out. Some sort of jamming device or program. Momo added, Izuku nodding to her. I got Melissa in the security room in the 100th floor, so we have that front covered. She is working on getting everything back under our control, since the mercenaries had a person with a tech work mess with the systems. Izuku explained, escorting the girls out the maintenance floor, and into an elevator. He waved to one of the visible cameras about, the previously inoperable doors opening, and already primed to take them high up. The trio got it and we brought up, Izuku filing the girls in the details, of how things happened on his end of things. The ride was short, but somewhat filled with tension. The girls noticed, that Izuku was restraining himself, hands closing into fists, before opening and repeating the motion, tightly clenched jaw, pupils constantly shifting from the normal emerald to their famous fear-inducing tone, and most of all, Izuku seemed to exhale aggression. One might even joke, that the vampire's behavior resembled that of Katsuki, except that instead of explosive bouts of ranting and rage, it was more of a focused, and centered ruthlessness akin to the cold edge of a sharp knife. They finally reached the 100th floor, the short ride somehow feeling a lot longer, and met up with Melissa. While the three females checked up with each other, Izuku went to the screens, trying to get a feel for the situation. Any other calls over the radio? He asked the blonde American without turning his attention away from the screens. No. Some meaningless chatter from some of the other grunts, but no specific call for them. Melissa said while pointing at the mercenaries at one corner of the room, tied up with their harnesses serving as improvised rope. Izuku echoed a content noise, eyes flickering among a few selected screens, and forming plans in his mind. How about the systems? Have you managed to get complete control over it? Melissa shook her head. Sort of, the software seems to be actively trying to keep me out. I have some control back, but a few areas are still out of my hand. Should not take long to fix it, I just need to figure out what is doing this. Melissa was already back on her chair, typing away on the keyboard. The vampire approached her, tapping on her shoulder to call her attention. I might have a solution for that, but first I need to ask something. He said out loud, Momo and Kyoka surely hearing it. I got some knowledge from one of them pertaining to her tech situation, which is most likely a work of her quirk. I can share the information with you, but I'll need to touch your mind. He explained, but Melissa grabbed one of his hands. The mind touch of Mesmerize from before had been an emergency, but now he had to properly talk with the girl. Should he begin to go down the slippery road of just coldly following with what was most logical to him, it would not be easy to climb out of it. Their face displayed seriousness. I trust you, Izuku. We don't have time to waste here, Papa and that thug are already on the vaults. Just get it on with it. He nodded, eyes glancing up at the other two in the room. Their eyes were focused on him, but there was no suspiciousness from either. Midoriya grunted as his answer. Right, might as well relay the plan I have in mind too. He said while closing his eyes, pulling on the necessary quirk factor. When the vampire opened his eyes, there were floodlights filled with eldritch power. Have a peek at the well of knowledge, little one. I shall grant it to you. Wow, that's quite a load. Melissa stated, her breathing becoming a tad bit labored. Izuku chuckled a bit, doing one last check over his things. Tired already. He teased, walking to exit of the room. It was just a few seconds, just the tip of the iceberg. He tapped the side of his brow. Kyoka, his hearing had returned a bit, lightly tapped her elbow against Momo. They're talking about the security system, right? Yeirozu, face painted with a deep blush, nodded. She held her hands over her mouth, and tried to act with grace. Tried. The two took a step to follow the vampire, but he turned around and waved one hand. No, you two stay here and guard Melissa. His order was immediately met with furrowed brows. Don't look at me like that. I have the mobility, stamina, and stealth to move without problems and aid the hostages. Besides, protecting Melissa is quite the priority right now. She is one of our most important assets right now, information. And if we lose that, we will be running around blind here. Once we get more people out and about, then we can run in squads. Kyoka understood the logic behind the vampire's words. She didn't want to sit back and play house, but she knew her limits. The rocker huffed, but accepted the instruction. She did, however, cross her arms over her chest and glared at the vampire. Now that they weren't in immediate danger, she noticed his new haircut. Hey, that looks nice on him. Yeirozu wished to put her versatility in the conversation, but since her battle from earlier, she was winded, and low on lipids. She hadn't eaten anything from the banquet party, the mercenaries attacking, before she had the opportunity, to even sample the delicacies cooked up. How rude of them. In the end the heiress nodded to Izuku, once they got the heroes up and running, she could eat something, and get back in the fight. At least one thing to help, hey. She called him out. She extended her right arm out, the shine of her quirk appearing on her offered hand. The vampire extended his own hand out, ready to catch whatever it was that Momo was creating. From her hand fell a calm radio much like the ones, that the mercenaries were using. The hemomancer quickly pocketed it, waiting for the quirk explanation, that was bound to follow. 
Since the early days, Izuku noticed that whenever Yoyorozu created something, she had the tendency to explain why she'd made the item. That radio is the latest in military communications. I made them earlier, but with the jamming and all the fighting, I sort of lost them. Father is friends with the company that makes them, and we got some models and blueprints. We can relay information without using the speakers of the building, and we can avoid having our conversations being tapped into. He nodded, thankful for the quick explanation. Thank you. Please, protect Melissa and take care of yourselves. I'll be back soon. It was a race against time for Izuku to act, but the Hemomancer couldn't foolishly rush through things and risk blowing his cover. He took the available elevator until he was a mere floor away from the ballroom reception, using electromagnetic vision to assure himself of the number of grunts and their position. His radio would relay a few messages, the jam on communications not entirely lifted to avoid raising suspicion. So long as the mercs thought themselves in the winning side, they would not act harshly. The vampire would stand atop the position of the grunts and leave on set position a small puddle of blood and dark matter. Normally his blood would waste away, if not in contact with him, but since it was full of certain quirk factors, some of which he had acquired today, this little new trick could be employed. Flammable blood plus shadow control plus explosive blood plus perpetuation in one unfired round of his recently acquired pistol. That combination was placed in about 25 locations directly atop the goons. Some would move a bit, but that was fine. With this, Izuku would at least impair, if not outright knock out the majority of the hostage takers. His plan ready, the vampire quickly took the elevator once more, but this time he opened the top hatch of it, and while pressing the button for the ballroom floor, he waited atop the elevator. There was a ping, that echoed in the room, Izuku waiting for a few seconds, sure that all the grunts would at the very least distract themselves, even if for one second. That was all that he needed. The vampire clicked his fingers, pulling on the quirk factors and springing his trap. I'll thank Shizaki-san later. She developed quite a lot of binding techniques. She hopefully won't mind me using one of her own. Ninpu, Kurochi's no Shibari, Ninja Arts, Black Tether Binding. The Hemomancer whispered to himself. Contrary to his soft-spoken words, there was a loud noise, and suddenly, black tendrils were bursting from the ceiling, heading towards all the armed grunts in the room. There were a few shouts and some shots were fired, but Izuku was quick to act. He rapidly left his hiding spot, ready to use blink to approach any grunt ready to fire. Much to his surprise, those that weren't taken out by his attack, were subdued by other people. Fucking. Die. Explosive blasts echoed about. It is rude to show up unannounced, especially with guns. Chill out for a moment. The sound of ice cracking followed by a Stokian voice. Really, guys? One-liners. One exasperated teen exclaimed, the crackle of lightning and the sharp scent of ozone become a bit prominent. Todoroki Shoto. Bakugo Katsuki. Kaminari Denki. Those three immediately rushed to action the moment they had the opportunity to, the chance that Izuku had granted them allowing them to act on their training. Right after that happened, the restraints that were holding All Might, and many other heroes were releasing, Izuku offering a thumbs up to the ceiling, where likely some hidden camera was relaying information back to girls. It is alright now. All Might's voice boomed throughout the room, the hero standing up from his previous position and rising up to his full height. I'll take care of all the other problems. Young Midoriya, Young Bakugo, Young Kaminari and Young Todoroki, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Please, do restrain these villains, while I take care of the rest. It was quite obvious, that the hero wanted to quickly disappear from around the numerous watchers. Izuka rapidly figured, that it probably had to do with the hero's limited time in hero form, and the problems, that would blow up, if his weakened figure was displayed here. As soon as he could, All Might fled the scene, taking one of the exits and immediately rushing to save David. Had the hero remained for just a while longer, the vampire could have relayed some very much needed information. The vampire sighed. Bound them up quickly. I will restrain them. He gave out the order, people turning to him, and staring at the vampire. It seemed like many were still out of it, in a confused stunned state. Don't you fucking order me about, you fucking bloodsucker. I'll do the fucking restraints. You probably suck one of these pussy ass losers dry. Bakugo shouted, dragging with him four grunts. He dropped the men in a corner, hands ready to blast in case any of them weren't dead enough. Todoroki walked closer to Izuku, his captures frozen in ice. When Izuku looked at the stoked teen with a questioning gaze, the youngest Todoroki merely shrugged his shoulders. You thought them out. You literally have a built-in flamethrower in your left arm, Shoto. Fair enough, you make a good point. Todoroki nodded and went closer to the frozen grunts, lighting only a small fire from his hand. He was quick to defrost his quarries, the grunts surrendering, before they could do anything else. The vampire turned to see Kaminari wave at him. Yo, Midoriya. A little help here. These guys are heavy. The blonde teen tried to drag one of the goons, but made little progress. The vampire displayed a tiny smile, quickly letting his shadowy tendrils to take care of the grunts. The foursome quickly gathered the grunts, Izuku binding all of them with shadow tendrils. 
He may have mixed just the tiniest bit of his own blood into the black mass, using it to stab lightly into the mercs, and drain some blood from them. It was one thing to drink, while a loner with trustworthy people, but it really wouldn't paint a pretty picture for the Hemomancer, if he began to rip into necks, while surrounded by people. He contented himself with just some scraps for now, applying the effect of permanency into the shadowy matter, and leaving it securing the grunts. You guys, come with me. Let the pros here handle the rest, I'll need help from all of you. Izuka quickly called his classmates, rushing back into the elevator and only glancing backwards once. It was better for them to leave before any other heroes realized that the situation was under control and try and control them. Todoroki was right behind Izuku, following suit ever since the vampire had bound the mercenaries here. Bakugo grumbled, but he too followed. He wasn't dumb, he knew that the vampire had likely discovered some incredible shit, and he wasn't going to be left behind. Kaminari rushed to follow the group, not sure where they were going, but willing to follow nonetheless. Whatever it was that the vampire was doing, had got to be a thousand times better than his waiter job. Damn that internet ad was a scam. Izuku's radio crackled to life, Melissa's distressed voice shouting from the speaker. Hurry please. They have Papa. They shot Sam. Izuku, they shot Sam. They have our work. Wolfram's grin couldn't get whiter. He had figured that David would try to drag on and buy time for whenever All Might tried to break out, but the Merc leader had other plans. By the time that the symbol of peace would arrive, he would be far away from the tech island, enjoying a smooth ride back home with all the tech he nicked away from the eggheads. The tech was chump change compared to what he would have once he gave the requested items to all for one. The quick amplification device and some regeneration formula and pills. If possible, he was to grab the vampire kit that was being studied. He was rather close to finishing the main objective. All that David needed was an incentive to work faster on opening the gigantic vault doors that hid the treasures he was waiting for. Oi, shield. He roughly called out, his remaining guards all throwing jeers at the old man. I don't think you understand the situation that you find yourself in. You should have already opened that vault. David, clearly very nervous about the situation, looked back. I am working as fast as I can, but these are our top level works. I'm not the only one privy to things here. My collaborators and the board members of I Island's council don't want these treasures to be so easily stolen. Wolfram huffed, smirking at the shield patriarch. Word games and dissimulation won't take you anywhere, shield. I guess I must really show that I mean business. Hey you, bring that old fart here. The mercenary leader waited as one of his goons went out of sight, returning soon after dragging an elder dressed in a butler's suit. The elder was roughly shoved towards the duo, Wolfram immediately pointing his pistol to the back of Sam's head. Just open the locks already, and get that thing open, shield, or you will return to your pretty little party of yours wearing a new fancy suit. Who knows, maybe red will suit you better. David. Don't give these brutes anything. All Might will help us. The man weakly said, David's heart immediately hurting as he glanced back, to see his very dear friend be treated so roughly. Please. Don't hurt him. I'm hurrying up. David shouted, hurriedly finishing the sequence of codes that would open the vault doors that stored some of the most precious items that I Island had to offer. Once the enormous vault began opening, David was shoved aside. He immediately glanced back to check on Sam, his heart filled with worry for the elder, but the old butler was different. He was no longer being pushed and grabbed by the other goons. Sam was fixing the cuffs of his suit, his face sporting a very regal and stoic expression. Your acting and language are all horrendous, Wolfram. You are very lucky to have me here. Sam said as if that was the most common thing in the world. David blinked his eyes, almost as if to deny the reality in front of him. You made me blow my cover. I wonder why did he trust you with this mission, when I was about to succeed on my own anyway. The merc leader laughed. Stop your bitching, old fart. Appreciate the show a little bit, not everything is about backstabbing people while smiling. Create some chaos once in a while, it is fun. Besides, you are getting paid too, so what's got you tilted? The butler moved his gaze towards David, the butler's expression entirely disinterested. My job or rewards are of no concern to you. Get the equipment and hurry up, who knows when that buffoon will try something. Sam stated, his gaze still looking down at David like one looks at trash. What are you looking at? Sam, what is going on? David shakily asked. His mind was realizing the situation well enough, yet he still had a hard time rationalizing it. Hmm. Oh, right, I forgot to turn them off. Nonchalantly, Sam fixed his tie, David blinking quickly, almost as if awakening from a deep sleep. That clear up your mind. The effects of lustros, aromatherapy and white light do tend to linger in the mind, but I'm sure that one of our men would happily help you find some common sense. The kick should suffice. Before David had time to process things, he received a punting kick from one of the mercenaries, his glasses shattering and flying off. David fell on the ground and groaned, his mind racing up. He coughed up spit, and began to dry heave. 
Sam's presence normally left him with peace of mind and pleasant feelings, but now the inventor couldn't stand, being this close to the butler, the smell emanating from him truly fell. Awake indeed. I'm told that the withdrawal effects are quite mean. A nasty smile bloomed in Sam's smile, but the butler didn't stay close for long. The vault gates were finally open, and the grunts were already raiding it clean, taking the first items that called their attention. David now noticed something that seemed so obvious before, but the truth that had been muddled in his mind was now displayed in full. The grunts that had taken the people in the ballroom hostage as well as these ones taking important stuff from the vault, were equipped with I Island's own production of firearms, the electromagnetic improved rail rifle dubbed PK Thunder. Fully automatic assault railgun rifles that fired improved 7.62mm rounds that could punch clean through most common heavy ballistic protection. How had they gotten their hands on the guns? The answer was staring him right in his face, holding a suitcase that caused a heavy weight to drop in David's stomach. The butler was now ignoring the presence of David, who was struggling on the floor, having another session of dry heaving. The old butler shook his head. Disgusting, David. You can't take care of yourself, and are still too dependent on me for the most basic of things. Come on, up, and at it. We still have some use for you. Maybe we might even allow you to see your daughter. Life sprang into David's frame, the man still heaving and coughing, but now he stared as fiercely as he could to the butler. Don't you dare bring my daughter into this. You have my life's works with you, gear and tech that can cover the costs of anything in your life ten times over. Leave us. Sam stared back unamused at David. Pathetic, David. Truly pathetic. Sam exclaimed, glancing back to see if Wolfram had already cleaned the vault. He searched one of pockets for something, feeling the light weight of the item and smiling to himself. He turned back towards David, finding the man to be charging at him. The old butler flinched in surprise, taking a punch to his jaw and falling on the ground, letting the suitcase be thrown a few feet away from him. Sam slowly raised himself, finding the mercenaries to be laughing at his humiliating display. David had once again fallen on the floor, too intoxicated to stand up. Wolfram, what the hell are your stupid grunts doing? Can these incompetent fools even do a simple guard job? Sam roared to the emerging mercenary leader, the red-haired man sporting a sour expression. Bang. Eh? Sam questioned, his ears ringing. The old butler stared at his chest, noticing a rapidly growing red spot on Immaculate's suit. Sam clattered on the floor, his life fluid painting the tiles of the vault room with a pool of crimson. Wolfram huffed, pointing his free hand towards the suitcase, the object suddenly flying to his hand. He grabbed it by the handle, taking the time to open the case, and inspect the veracity of the item. Inside the case, resting atop black memory foam, was a circlet-like object, almost like a crown. It looked fancy and delicate, but the apparent power behind it could turn, depending on the quirk, a man into a god. Luckily for the merc leader, his quirk was top-notch stuff. Well fart, you got too greedy. Just because you know how to lick a boot spotless, it doesn't mean that the same boot won't be used to bash your brains in. I was in a good mood, you know. Was willing to let you bring this little fancy trinket to him, but you had to have all the glory to yourself, huh? Wolfram got close to Sam, and searched the man's body in for something. Not a few moments later he produced a grey cylinder from inside the old butler's suit. You have quite the smooth fingers for an old fart, but I'm smarter. The red-haired man pressed on the bottom of the cylinder, the item hissing steam, as if released the inner pressure and opened up, sliding the cover to reveal seven metallic red pills with a white cross painted in their center. It is quite hard to believe it, right? One of these could save a man from the brink of death back to full strength, and even enhance them. How much would a single one sell in the black market? How much cash do you think that those star and spangles would fork out to have just one or two of these in stock, to heal up some important schmuck, or even a VIP hero? The heroes, the villains and everything else in between, desperate to buy a single pill from us. Something that could be switched ever so easily with a common coal pill. Wolfram's smile now became a deranged thing, the man opening the slot and extracting one of the pills from inside the container, placing it in his pocket, while he closed the container, and sealed it back, placing the cylinder in his own coat. Well, I'd love to stay and chat more, but we have a right to catch. Come on boys, grab the dear professor, and let's get going. Wolfram ordered, trying to reach Carmine on the radio. His only answer was static. TSK, maybe that bother is already up and about. Damn it, and I liked her, nice tits and pretty face for a military brat. Oh well, what a waste. David was feeling utterly miserable, being dragged around by two grunts following Wolfram. He turned his gaze back to the old butler, who had been a loyal companion and friend for over ten years. Apparently the truth was something entirely different. Yet, the decent man inside David couldn't help but ask. What about him? Wolfram turned around, curious as to what the shield was referring to. What about him? The merc leader's smirk took on a vicious mocking visage. Even when the old fart messed with you like that you are still worried about him. What a kind soul. Ha. The leader and his men began to laugh up, amused at the notion. What, were you butt buddies or something? Did his quirk make you feel good? 
Since you are such a worried saint for the life of your fellow men, shall I call you Pope David? Wolfram approached the shield patriarch and lightly smacked his face, doing a few light taps, as if to provoke a pride reaction out of the inventor. David could only painfully moan, the lingering after effects of the quirks used on him causing the terrible weakness and pounding headache he was suffering from. Come on, saint. Seeing that David was too weak to be giving out answers, and seeing as his timetable was short, Wolfram stopped with his provocations, and began to walk to the elevator, that would take him to the rooftop. Boss, the prof is kind of right though. What do we do with the old timer? One of the grunts asked, pointing his rifle to the struggling butler on the floor. Wolfram was already disinterested in whatever had to pertain with Sam. Ah, whatever, just put him in Pope David's tab or something, I don't really give a shit. The grunt shrugged, and saw Wolfram and his guards, together with David, get in the elevator and head out. He aimed the sights of his rifle to the struggling Sam. You heard the boss, old timer. Nothing particular against you, or anything like that, but it is what it is. Squeeze. Ping. Bang. 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 The grunt fell on the ground, his vest a mess as the bullet-resistant plate that was made to withstand high-caliber rounds protected him from death, but not from the full might of the impacting shots. The spent magazine of the pistol clattered on the ground, the weapon itself following soon after as the person who had pulled the trigger rushed to meet the herd elder. Melissa. San. Izuku, I saved him. I saved him. Melissa shouted on her own radio, rushing to meet San, and help him out. Help me, Melissa. The radio comm crackled to life, Izuku's roaring voice ordering a merciless command. Do not get close to him. He is working with the enemy that orchestrated this. Melissa, who had rushed here by herself, was shocked. Izuku was ordering her to leave San, their dear friend and trusty butler, to die. He was bleeding, terribly hurt and he wanted her to leave him to die. How cruel. How could he? Izuku. I can't do that. I have to help him. She took a few more steps towards San, but the radio once more crackled to life. Melissa. This is an absolute order. Do not get close to him. The girl flinched in place, her body disobeying her will, and locking up in place. What the hell? I can't move. Melissa tried to move her legs, but then her muscles painfully contracted and cramped up, not allowing her to move. Melissa, help me. The blonde American began to cry, tears of sadness painfully streaming down her face. Izuku. Please. Negative. I'm near, I'll deal with it. Do not get closer touch him. Stay far from him. Kyoka and Momo finally managed to catch up, finding the scene and wondering what was going on. The two spotted the elder lying in a pool of his own blood and rushed to aid him. However, stay away. Melissa's voice trembled, but she shouted to the other duo. She herself seemed to be spooked by her own act. It took another minute for Izuku to arrive on the floor with his temporary squat and two, the vampire immediately appearing from a smoky fog close to the elder. The man seemed to be very close to hypovolemic shock, still trying to drag himself closer to the blonde American. Melissa, help me. Izuku almost growled to the man, the disgusting smell that wafted to the vampire's nostrils making him incredibly irritated. A tendril of blood emerged from his hand, 